Good evening. Um, I don't have the awesomeness of Ken to do this. <laughs> yes, <you do. laughs> but it is an honor for me to say, come up and speak about Kurt Adams. To say that Kurt Adams is passionate about education is an understatement. He's not only an exceptional alum of Bishop Kelly, he embodies the LaSallian mission upon which this school was founded. Kurt graduated from Bishop Kelly in 1991 and earned his bachelor's in history and master's in school psychology from the University of Tulsa. He then worked as a student counselor at Bishop Kelly while working on his doctoral degree in educational administration and policy studies from OSU. During his time at Bishop Kelly, Kurt was drawn to the idea of founding a local school based on the San Miguel School that had been established in Providence, Rhode Island by Brother Lawrence Goyette to help lift children out of poverty by providing them with a Catholic education based on the teachings of St. John Baptist de La Salle. With the help and encouragement of Brother Norman McCarthy and Brother David Poos, Kurt visited other San Miguel schools in Chicago and St. Louis. He then wrote his doctoral feasibility study on the need for a similar school in Tulsa and what area would best be served. Startup funds were secured and San Miguel Middle School opened in the fall of 2004 in the Kendall Whittier neighborhood of Tulsa. To date, over 250 students have graduated from San Miguel and gone on to Bishop Kelly, Cashel Hall, Holland Hall, Washington, and several other public schools in Tulsa. After high school, these students have continued their education at trade schools, junior colleges, Southeastern State University, TU, OU, and OSU, to name a few. Our graduates have degrees in cell and molecular biology, graphic design, criminal justice, and veterinary technician, and other fields of interest. St. John Baptist de La Salle said, to touch the hearts of your students is the greatest miracle you can perform. Kurt Adams and his vision continues to do just that for so many lives. Kurt, we're proud of you. Thank you for all you've done and continue to do. Thank you. You certainly are the, are the best, and I'm going to tell my boys that every time we drive by your house, we're no longer ding-donging ditching you, but we're going to start to fork you and caution tape. And so, uh, apparently Noah learned a new one, which is putting Fruit Loops in the yard, so if you find Fruit Loops in the why. Uh, I was actually worried. I, I thought Fred Davis might be up here, and uh, who was the dean of students when I was here, and my friends. Uh, who are here can attest to several run-ins with Fred. Uh, so I was starting to sweat a little bit, thinking, oh, I'm wondering which of the many stories he would probably tell uh, about me, but fortunately, uh, it was Margaret. And so uh, I can already tell this is so much different than high school because I brought my homework with me. And uh, I, I think I'm, I'm ready to turn it in. Uh, like high school, uh, I copied it from my friend Kevin Duffy. So, so Duff, you're the man. We'll, we'll see. I, there's some English teachers here, so we'll see how well you did at, at, at the end of this. Uh, so, I have to read this. Hopefully I'll get through it. I, typically, when I, when I teach and my students see me going up to the lecture with notes, they leave. So I'm glad that you guys are staying here. But, uh, Really, let me start just by thanking Father Castle and, and Doug Thomas and everybody at Bishop Kelly who had a part in really putting this night together. Uh, this is so generous of you. Uh, it is quite an honor to be here and to be a recipient of, of this uh, award. I also certainly, uh, Sister Mary Servant, 
Uh, Jean and, and Kelsey, I, I think Kelsey is on her way, I've heard. I just want to say that, oh, great. Uh, it, is, it is quite humbling to share this evening with you. Uh, as I look at your profile and your work, uh, it's inspiring. Uh, it's transforming lives in numerous ways. It is a true embodiment of the LaSallean call to serve with faith, love, and justice. So um, thank you for uh, allowing me to, to share the moment with you. I made my parents cry a lot probably growing up, and now they're making me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the one thing that came to my mind when I was thinking, I was like, oh, well, how do I thank Baba and George? Like, oh, well, uh, this certainly, I know this does not rescind all the stupid things I did growing up. Um, but hopefully it's a, it's a small indication that, that I really did uh, internalize the positive example that you showed me uh, in how to live life. So, so thank you. Um, I also, I, I want to thank the educator who really... Should we take you back? Okay. I have a pretty big voice too. So. <laughs> Uh, the educator who inspires me the most, and that's my wife, Vicki. Uh, I probably make her cry a lot, too, so. But I, I have learned uh, more about thriving schools and engaging learning environments uh, from her than, than any theory or research that I've conducted, so, so thank you, Vicki. As you can probably tell, uh, if you knew me in high school, you would probably agree that uh, I think I had a better chance of winning the lottery than being recognized for an alumni award. <laughs> uh, let alone one dedicated to education. So uh, my adolescence was filled with a lot of energy and a lot of vitality. Uh, it just wasn't really directed toward academic pursuits. <laughs> to point that out, as a senior, I aspire to the noble calling of being a ski bum. <laughs> And, and here I am, which raises the question, uh, what happened? I ask myself that a lot. Uh, many things happened. Uh, certainly not the least was um, Brother Norman McCarthy. And those of you who knew him, uh, his, his proclivity for inviting you to take him out to lunch or dinner, and then he would talk about Thomas Merton and centering prayer and so many esoteric spiritual and philosophical concepts that you really walked away thinking that you were in the presence of a true mystic. The point I want to make tonight, though, actually has to do a lot with um, my research and, and, and my guiding principles in this profession of education. Uh, and in particular, a lot about the flawed logic that that pervades institutions like education and ends up perpetuating a lot of the dysfunctions that constrain all of our innate tendencies toward adaptation and flourishing. De La Salle recognized this in 17th century France. He saw the plight of the working poor as, resulting, as not resulting from deficiencies in their capacity to learn and to thrive but rather an unjust system with oppressive and suppressive structures that confine the working poor to the margins and the shadows of society. De La Salle knew that the poor did not need to be fixed. The system was the overwhelming problem. And so sadly, our educational system in some places continues to view marginalized children and adolescents as the problem. Children growing up in poverty or dealing with adverse childhood experiences are often labeled at risk for academic failure, inferring they are different, different in capacity and need fixing. Some may justify this logic by pointing to statistics showing that low-income minority children have lower achievement than, minority, than their non-minority peers, have graduation rates as low as 30% in some urban districts, have greater odds of being incarcerated than graduating college. But such data actually obfuscate the true causes of these realities. These children have just as much ability and potential as anyone else, certainly more than I did. The dysfunction does not emanate from the child. It resides in a system and a larger society that's incapable of adapting 
to their unique learning needs and their unique developmental needs. So let me give you some examples. What we know from the science of talent and expertise development, how our intelligence and our cognitive structures are malleable, they're plastic, they grow and they change and they evolve. It's alarming to think that in many high poverty communities, schools sit in desks, students sit in desks for six hours a day doing worksheets, being talked at by teachers, and being labeled, judged, and tracked by bad multiple choice tests. Given what we know about the positive benefits of the arts, of humanities, of exercise and sports, and other kinds of enrichment activities, it's astounding how little access high poverty children have to these opportunities. Knowing that summer brain drain is a real phenomenon, it's unbelievable that for a country with the largest economy, we can't offer more meaningful and engaging learning opportunities in the summer for economically poor children. Understanding the complexities of a modern workforce and a global knowledge-based society, it's shocking to find that teaching and learning in many high poverty schools remain focused on low-level knowledge and skills, neglecting deeper learning attributes like knowledge transfer, problem solving, creativity, communication, and teamwork. It's incomprehensible to me that minority and high poverty students are disproportionately held back suspended, placed in special education, denied access to a college-bound curriculum, and taught by uncertified novice teachers. And finally, knowing demands and complexities of good teaching, as well as the positive difference in the life of a child and the health of a democracy that teachers make, it's incredible to me that we argue over a $4,000 pay raise when teachers are paid at least $30,000 under their market worth. Lest we think these problems are confined to high poverty schools, think, think again. National data from Gallup report that nearly three out of four students find school to be boring and unstimulating. Three out of four students report that schools are uninteresting places to learn. Clearly the sample wasn't taken from Bishop Kelly students. <laughs> Only 35% of students believe they could find ways around problems. Only 47% reported being hopeful about their future. And only 39% agreed that adults in school cared about them. From 2011 to 2017, the percentage of students indicating they are meaningfully engaged in schools decreased from 67% to 47%. The data are more alarming for high school students, where only 35% of high school students report being meaningfully engaged. Stated simply, the educational system in far too many places is undermining student potential. In my time at San Miguel and studying the social psychology of thriving schools, I have observed numerous examples to the above norms. Places where students are engaged in active learning, solving complex challenges and problems, mastering concepts and processes, being challenged, encouraged to make mistakes, learning from their mistakes, playing and having fun in school, getting recess time, forming meaningful attachments and relationships to peers, to God, building their faith, standing up against bullying and violence, and many other pursuits that enrich their hearts, minds, and character. It's easy to affirm this work that happens in places like San Miguel, as well as other really remarkable and extraordinary places by referring to these places as remarkable and extraordinary. But in reality, these examples sh should be the norm, not the exceptional outliers. What is remarkable, in a perverse way, is that the social dysfunction inspiring De La Salle and the brothers of the Christian schools in 17th century France remains so entrenched and pervasive today. Simply stated, the need for La Salle education has never been greater. So, I actually still dream of being a ski bum someday. <laughs> um, but I can say without reservation that a career in education has provided more thrills, uh, more meaning and insight into life than even the, the best bluebird pow powder day could offer. Uh, I'm humbled uh, by the men and women and students and families of San Miguel, many of who are here tonight, uh, by the Margaret Ellisons, of the world, the Katie Boudreaux's, the Juan Hernandez's, uh, you guys inspire me. 
I'm grateful for my Lasallian education and certainly the opportunity that Brody and Noah might also be inspired by the Lasallian charism. So Margaret, it, it, this shows our connection. You ended with a quote from De La Salle, and it just so happens to be the same quote that I have. So, to touch the hearts of your students is the greatest miracle you can perform. Uh, so in closing, just thank the teachers at Bishop Kelly uh, for performing this miracle on me. So, thank you.